of course, we're here to talk about the Abraham Accords that between August of 2020 and this month, January of 2021, six nations have signed on to, uh, with, to normalize relations with Israel. So we're here tonight to talk about what are the Abraham Accords um, and what they mean for the world, for Israel, and for Israelis. In order to do that, we have two wonderful speakers and an incredible facilitator. Um, I will introduce our facilitator, Karine Lagziel, in just a moment. But uh, right now, I will uh, remind everybody that, uh, yes, this is a meeting and not a webinar. That means that we can see you and you can see us. Um, but we are going to ask you to stay on mute. Uh, if you have any questions, please put your questions into the chat box. You can put it for everyone or you can send them uh, privately to Lauren or to myself. Um, and uh, we will make sure that those questions get to our, our panelists at the end of our evening. Um, we may ask you at the end of the evening to speak up to share your own question, but uh, we will ask you to stay on mute for the program. And so it is my pleasure and true delight to introduce Karin. Um, many of us are already familiar with Karin, Karin Lagziel, who is the first Upper East Side Senior Community Shlicha um, emissary of the State of Israel. Her job is to strengthen community uh -huh. bonds through educational programs and uh, help connect us here in New York to Israel's history, culture, society, and people. Karin has a BA in communication education and political science with honors from Ben Gurion University in the Negev. She has an MBA in business administration specializing in social leadership from the Mandel Foundation. And before she came to us on the Upper East Side, Karin was the director of education programs for the humanitarian organization Israel in Dominica. Um, I don't know that we've ever officially introduced you before, Karine. Um, yeah, I know. Very Thank impressive. You so being, but you are somebody we know and love. Um, and so I leave, uh, I leave the program now to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. So I'm very excited to open today's program and to kind of explore, dive in and explore together what's the meaning of the application, like Sarah told us, of the agreement. But especially, what does it mean for the area, for Israel, and for the future of the two-state solution? I'm excited to, to introduce to you our guest for today. So joining us today is expert, policy expert, Dr. Karen Freeman and journalist Yona Leibzon. Um, I will present them fully in just a second, but as Sarah said, I, I would wanna remind you already at this point that we look forward towards your engagement throughout the whole, throughout the whole program. I'll be starting with some questions for both of our speakers, and then hopefully we'll move to the Q&A so we can all kind of engage in this discussion. So Yuna, Yuna Leibzon is the U.S. correspondent for Channel 12 News, Israel's most popular TV channel and news broadcaster. A journalist with experience across platforms from radio to talk shows to international television news. Yuna is currently based in New York. Yuna was also born in Lithuania and made Aliyah with her family during the 90s. So she knows a thing or two of uh, uh, what it means to be a part of the Jewish community outside of Israel. We have with us also Dr. Karen Freeman, is uh, the Dean and Chief Academic Officer of the Spertus Institute. Her current research focus on Israel and conflict education within Jewish educational settings. She had a head fellowship with the Wexner Foundation and the Schusterman Foundation, and her work has been supported and recognized by the US Institute of Peace the Chicago Project on Security and Terrorism, and more. Karen and her family lives in uh, Evanston, Illinois. So Karen and Yuna, thank you so much for joining us today. I'll start with a very kind of a simple, we like to start from the beginning, just to make sure we're all kind of in line and we all have the basis to start a deeper uh, uh, conversation. So a very easy question I hope to begin with is what is the Abraham Accords and what does it actually mean in terms of concrete changes between the countries? Um, and if I can add, to this even a little bit more, uh, I would like to ask you, Karen, to start with uh, what it means to the region. Terrific. So um, maybe I'll just start by sharing my screen for a second. Um, and as a as sort of an orientation, because I think one of the interesting things about the Abraham Accords is that 
in order to do that, I needed actually to zoom out to a much broader map than I would have ordinarily zoomed out to. So typically when we think of the Middle East, we think of perhaps a more narrow map and it highlights you know, Israel's immediate neighbors. But when we start to think about the Abraham Accords, it's, it's really essential to zoom out. And so you can see that the Abraham Accords were a series of agreements that were signed that normalized relations initially with the UAE and Bahrain, and since then with Morocco and Sudan. And there's questions about who, who else will follow suit. And what you can see here is that here's the UAE, not a neighboring country, really uh, nestled amongst the Gulf states, right? Not really in, in the Levant. Um, and Morocco, right, all the way in the, the tip of North Africa. Um, and here's Sudan, obviously. And so the first, the first thing to note is that suddenly, uh, I think what it means for the region is that Israel is now part of this region in a very different kind of way. And even though if we look behind the headlines a little bit, this has been true for a long time, right? And so we know that for a long time, there were economic relationships that had been already explored and established between the UAE and Bahrain, but um, on a much more sort of underneath the surface. And this normalization elevated and began to begin to sh really um, shifted a lot of the regional politics, both in terms of how we think of the region as a whole, and I think we'll get into that a little bit more, whether they are sort of, if we can even use a term such as the Arab world or the Arab street, whether these terms are even relevant anymore, or whether these are now, Israel's now really enmeshed within the regional politics of the, the Gulf states, right? Some might even say that Israel's interests today are much more aligned with Saudi Arabia than with, with even elements of the West, right? And that's a really big dramatic shift. And these kinds of normalization agreements have begun to create the opportunity for thinking about Israel as a, as, a, as a regional actor that's embedded in the regional dynamics that exist within the region. Um, if we look at some of the details, I think some of the, the interesting shifts were the, the areas of cooperation that had been established. And so here we're, we're thinking of everything from what we might expect, like establishment of peace, diplomatic relations and normalization, but also issues like principles of international law govern, governing relations between states in which they recognize each other's sovereignty and develop friendly relations of cooperation between them, but importantly, and maybe even more significant between their peoples, right? And I think here is one of the, the shifts that I know Yuna will speak about in a second. They committed, at least in the case of the UAE, though not in the case of Morocco, to establishing of embassies as they had before, as, as, as a new thing, um, and peace and stability where here we, we talk specifically about um, preventing terrorist attacks against their respective territories. And so here is sort of an interesting, they're committing to preventing terrorism that emanates from within their borders and making certain that they don't support um, terrorists or any sort of activity that might be directed in one direction or the other. There's, many co there's a lot of cooperation that's outlined everything from finance and investment, civil aviation, innovation, trade, economic relations, it's a long list of areas at which makes it not seem sort of surface level, right? If we think of past peace agreements, like even with Egypt and Jordan, sometimes people would refer to them as a cold peace. It was on paper, it, it established that there would be a quiet border, but it didn't necessarily outline or even get to, even though they were neighboring states, to the level of understanding that included diplomatic and peaceful relations, but everything from commitment to recognizing each other's each other and getting to know the people, right? Which I think is a really important component and economic cooperation on many different levels that are outlined and then mutual understanding of coexistence, which includes people to people program, interfaith dialogue, cultural and academic exchanges, many of which even in the, the year, right? As, as Rabbi Berman had mentioned, it's a very short amount of time. We're already seeing this kind, these kinds of exchanges. Right? I mean, I, there've been like fun articles about kosher restaurants sprouting up in these places that really allow for the kind of cultural exchange that I think is the aspiration of these kinds of agreements. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Karen, for kind of giving us the basic. And um, Yuna, I wanna ask you about the, first a, a little bit of what was happening behind the scene with this agreement, as a lot of policymakers were actually saying that they were so surprised. Uh, at the time, we also know there was a rotation agreement between Benjamin Netanyahu and, uh, uh, and Benny Gantz. And, uh, um, and we even know that uh, uh, Benny Gantz didn't really know, knew too much on this agreement. So what did we know and how did we come to this moment? Uh, what did we see in the day itself? 
So um, first, as Karen mentioned, I think that there's something that if we look years before, there were always some sort of communication behind the scenes, in front of the scenes, with, between the Israeli government, Israeli heads of states, different foreign ministers. They all wanted to show that Israel can have peace with the Arab countries without even having a full peace or a full um, commitment and understanding with Palestinians. And we'll touch that because this is a, a major and basic uh, point uh, with, when we talk about the Abraham Accords. Um, but I, so I do want to say that if we even know today that what is now called the official Israeli embassy in the UAE used to be a very undercover uh, representation um, and its diplomats were in UAE, Israeli diplomats, they worked undercover, they had different company names, but everybody kind of knew it was everybody's interest. Um, the same with uh, Morocco, for example, for many years, people are trying to have this peace, have recognition. We have a lot of Israelis going to Morocco every year. We have a huge Jewish community that came from there. A big, um, um, a lot of people that made Aliyah from there. So there's also the sentimental thing for a lot of Israelis, especially with Morocco, that maybe they don't have another. But um, if we go a year, a year ago, um, I, I was just, you know, when like the Facebook reminds you of things and it looked like a, a different world. And I was shocked that it was just a year ago uh, because we were a lot of people at the White House all together inside the briefing room. Um, and, and then in the in the East Wing, um, in the big dining hall there. And, and it was Netanyahu going there to meet Donald Trump for him and Jared Kushner presenting the deal of the century, they called it, which was kind of this, a, a big aspiration. And we all were wondering like, what are we doing here? What is this going to be? Is this a peace plan? Because I mean, are we having, are we having peace with the Americans, with the American administration? This is supposed to be with the Palestinians, right? But they're not here. And they're talking about this peace in the Arab world or where is the Arab world? And then suddenly, the big scoop that was there, we were starting to talk about like, we were standing, the cameras behind us, everybody was around us, and we were all searching, who are the interesting people, the ambassadors that are there? And suddenly we saw the, um, uh, the ambassador of the United Arab Emirates, fellow type that was there, we were all, okay, bingo, we have something. They're not just talking about something, it is something bigger. Um, and you were talking about elections, and I just want to say that um, Israel is now going forward with its fourth election within uh, the uh, less than, than two years. Um, there were three elections. They could not establish a government. Once they did, um, it, 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 it didn't work out as we see. And there's another election during COVID and the crisis. And when this happened a year ago, um, it was just, just, just like inside of this election um, coalition agreement talks. And not just Netanyahu came, but also um, uh, Benny Gantz, which was the head of the, the second biggest party, and, and met there also with the Trump. So it was part of this very political thing. Um, so, so I, I, I want to say a, a little thing about that is that we were talking and there was this presentation and then we went for a briefing with Netanyahu and he was telling us, well, um, it's not just a peace plan. We're going forward with the things that are important for us. And on Sunday, um, we are going to bring to the cabinet a, a decision um, about annexation. And we were like wondering, okay, it didn't take a few minutes before we requested a comment from the White House and they said, we don't know anything about annexation. And instead of everybody talking about the deal of the century and what exactly does it mean and this big day of declaring at the White House, it, it became a talk about annexation. And we'll talk ahead how this created a path in some way for us to reach um, the Abraham Accords. And another thing that I want to say kind of behind the scenes that we were, can understand why this is so different for Israelis and for um, Bahrainians and, and, and people and, and, and Emiratis and, and other countries that Israel uh, had the um, normalization with. 
So in uh, September 15th, when there was the signing, I came a few days before, it was already during COVID. And I, I was the only one from the US. We had a very small group coming from Israel um, to cover it, each channel. And you know, they said like one or maybe two people to cover it because of the restrictions. And I remember that I was talking with the Emirati journalists there and they were saying they were opening studios there and they had so many people there. And it, for, it was like this huge thing for them. And a lot of Israelis in my editor and they asked me, I mean, how is this happening? How, I mean, why are they making such a big deal out of this and sending so many people? And I reminded him that while we Israelis are always used to having talks about some peace process, you know, it, it, it's, it's like it's Palestinians, but it also other countries all the time. We're used to being at the White House every six months because of some issue. Um, it, it's not the same for other countries, from countries from the Gulf area, especially countries that are smaller, Bahrain, um, Arab Emirates, um, and, and other countries. It's not, it, it's not like that for Israelis. It, so I think in Israel, we're a lot more cynical and we'll get to that than um, in other countries. And I would add um, that I do think that the reason in the end that this normalization happened now, it's not just because, well, Israeli government is trying so much time and now it succeeded or that Jared Kushner is this genius that realized they can do something that others can or that Palestinians are not really a problem anymore because they are. Uh, we do have the new situation. Well, it's not new, but it's relevant for now with Iran. And we do see an administration that is reaching the end of its days. We didn't know yet then there's going to be another uh, win for Trump. It's not going to be, be for four more years or not. And everybody were fe was feeling that. I mean, this is like the money time to do things because of all those interests. Wow, you know, you opened up so much for, uh, for us and obviously we'll go back a lot of what are the current threats uh, in the Middle East and on Israel and we'll go back to what was some of the reaction that we heard in the streets. But before we do all of that, Karen, I want to ask you if you can uh, help us to do some uh, seder, uh, organize kind of the terms. What does it mean when we use all uh, the different terms of uh, peace versus normalization? How is all of this uh, different from maybe the peace agreement that we had in the past with Egypt or Jordan? And specifically, if there's any differences between the agreement that was done with different uh, countries, including just like the process, because we know that uh, Bahrain and the UAE uh, started and just lately, about a month uh, uh, and a little ago, uh, Morocco joined all of this. So if you can help us do some seder in all of that. Sure. Um, and I think, you know, part of the reaction or the mixed reactions to these deals was because these terms were sort of being batted around interchangeably, peace deals, normalization. And what's interesting about these terms is that in some ways they're the same. It's about normalizing relations between countries. It's about peace, right? The challenge is that these countries, unlike past peace agreements with Egypt or Jordan, never fought with Israel, right? And none of its wars did the UAE or Bahrain contribute any forces to any past wars. By the way, that's not true of other non-boarding countries like Iraq, for example, who did in the past contribute or supported different um, engagements. The UAE and Bahrain were actually not involved. There are no unresolved territorial disputes. And so here was a normalization where the trading was not over land, right? Or even, you know, that wasn't even a, a factor in any of, any of these. And their capitals are very far from each other. And so to Yunus' point, even though they had some level of economic relations, and we know that they had longstanding, mostly covert cooperation, even in the area of security, a lot of spyware, including joint military exercises that we learned more about, even direct sale of military equipment, this was really sort of under the radar, right? And so there were these agreements. And so this normalization not only was longstanding and was sort of the formalization of someone, for those who had been watching the region would say, oh, right? This is just a, a little step. It's also very different from countries that had had interstate disputes, you know, three times in the past before they uh, reached into a peace agreement. Um, the second piece is that 
um, these governments are looking to cooperate on areas that are far beyond security and intelligence, right? This notions of direct flights and overflights are things that are actually quite important. And the level of enthusiasm feels very different, right? I think even in the case of Jordan, who I think was a warmer piece, the level of enthusiasm that we see here and actually the, the leaning into these kinds of agreements um, is a little bit different. Um, I think the, the other piece is, is a question around timing. And I think Yuna touched about some of the domestic issues that had been coming around, but it's also interesting to think about like, what were the Emirati's interests, for example, in entering into this agreement? And one of the things that's worth noting and we can come back to is that there's a lot of goodies that were coming for this deal, including approved sales of the F-35, which is an advanced weapons platform that very few countries in the region have access to. Um, and even though the Israeli position will continue to be military superior, probably, for a very long time into the future, this is sort of a marker of getting top shelf military equipment from the United States, something that neither the UAE nor, UAE nor Bahrain would have had access to absent this deal. Um, and so, and, and if you look at the debates within the Netanyahu government, a lot of them were actually about the sale of these weapons and not actually about normalization of relations. And so there was the sense of like, where are the economic and security interests of both parties as they enter into this deal? Now, I think when we think about Morocco, which is just the most recent state to enter, and at the last time, Karin, you and I spoke about this, you said, well, who's next, <laughs> right? And we had sort of speculation about who might enter um, the four. And, and Morocco was a good candidate, right? In part because for them, this is not a new agreement. This was a return or resumption to earlier relations that had begun in 1994, shortly after the Oslo Accords, and that were cut off after the Second Intifada, which began in, in 2000. And so here, there are clear economic incentives and as Yuna mentioned, there were deep historical, cultural, religious, and even personal roots that animated the motivations of Morocco. And it's interesting that even within their constitution, the Moroccan constitution, they actually pay homage to their Hebraic and Mediterranean influences. And so there are many um, interesting kind of connections, not only of the large immigration from Morocco, but there are, there's some evidence to suggest that the first inhabitant, Jewish inhabitants of Morocco date back all the way to 70 CE. We see that Muhammad, King Mohammed V, current uh, protected Jew, or the past king pr protected Jews during World War II, right? And so when the Nazis tried to persecute Jews in Morocco, he actually proclaimed that in fact, he would not turn over the Jews and that his Jews, the Jewish residents of Morocco were just as much his, his citizens as any other residents of Morocco. Right. And, so, and unlike a lot of other Arab countries. That's right. And so there's a real difference here in the pride in the Moroccan Jewish heritage and the way in which we see it. And yet it's been a long time where there weren't good relations, right? And so what did they get? Um, they got recognition that the Western Sahara, both American and Israeli recognition that this area was Moroccan. This is in dispute with Algeria, right? So they had their own domestic um, interests. And the other difference that they took was that the Moroccan king actually called Mahmoud Abbas as he was about to enter this and said, we're fully committed to the Palestinian cause. And what we find is that actually where President Mahmoud Abbas protested and felt very betrayed and was very vocal about the other agreements, he's actually been quite silent about the agreement with Morocco. And the Moroccan street by and large continues to be very supportive of the Palestinian cause. And so it's interesting to see the differences in the domestic reactions of the Morocco agreement and even the, the, these little nuances, which really represent, I think, shifts in the way different Arab states are relating um, to the Palestinian cause and how, and how they're, they're, they continue to either vow participation and support or have sort of backed off in different ways. Thank you so much, Karen. And we'll definitely go back to the uh, to Abbas and the Palestinians and their reaction. But before that, Yuna, I want to stay on the uh, on the topic uh, that Karen just brought of time and, and interest. And I want to ask you about the relationship between uh, between the current, well, not anymore actually, uh, the past uh, government that was here in the United States, uh, Donald Trump, and between uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, and how that momentum looked like, and if there's anything that you want to share with us on kind of like the the what we can maybe see in the future of the relationship between Biden and Netanyahu, and what does maybe means for the uh, agreements, and what we'll see coming up. Well, I have to say today, for example, people were talking about um, in Israel, it's that it's been two weeks uh, since the inauguration and Biden and Netanyahu have yet to talk over the phone. 
Um, so I, I think uh, we are entering a new era. And I think um, even though Biden and Netanyahu has such a very long relationship between them, a good, a bad, um, before we open it up for questions, I will show the clip for everybody, just a quick reminder of this relationship because it really had its, you know, love moments and, 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 and the ones that were less in, in, in that way. Um, it, but I do think that it's true that Netanyahu and Trump were together on the same page. In a lot of ways, it sometimes also hurt Israel. And also people that are Netanyahu supporters sometimes acknowledge that we're getting a lot from Trump as a country, as, as a way of the Israeli interest. But there is a price for that. And there's always a question, is it worth it? And in terms of the Abraham Accords, I think that the fact that it's not just because it's Netanyahu and Trump, I think it's, it, it was more of a, of a Jared Kushner and it was his project. And I think that it's the realization that there's all these interests around that Israel was very, very, very smart to take on and to see, okay, so they're this administration and they're in their final months and they're before election and they can show their, you know, successes and how they're making peace in the Middle East the way that no one thought before, right? I mean, there was this John Kerry video circulating around among, among Israelis. Um, he's saying that, um, hear my word, there's not going to be any peace with any Arab country before there's peace between Israel and the Palestinians. And this was like this paradigm that was kind of, and there's nothing more that Trump would love to prove that someone like John Kerry and, and all the Democrats before him. And, and, and again, this thing that everybody was doing is doing against, right? It's part of his theme in general, not just regarding to peace. And he's the one who can have this, who can have the deal of the century. And Israel, on top of that, realized that there's a, things are changing in the region. Um, the US pulled out of the Iranian nu nuclear deal and Iran is becoming more and more threatening, not just towards Israel, but towards other countries in the region, countries with which uh, Israel can have now relation, normalization, and it could be something that is up on the surface, not just behind the scenes, as Karen talked about, but something that is showing the world and, and showing, okay, we have a coalition now, we can do things together against Iran and show that we have one front also for the, American government, the, 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 the US administration, whoever it is. And I, I, I wanna show one example of how these things are sometimes people talk and talk and then there's like this one thing and you take advantage of that and you move forward. Um, I was actually in DC when they declared about the normalization and the agreement with Morocco. And I was meeting people that were involved in this. And I know for a fact that if they have known you know, even like a day before, they would cancel my meeting. There's no way I could be, you know, like around them and meeting them in a day so busy and so crazy. And it's like media and everybody and everybody's talking to everybody. But these are things that happen in the last minute. And Israel was like, you know, just like informed. Okay, so are, are you in it? Because they're in. And the reason had nothing to do with Israel. It, it, it was that for a long time, even though Morocco was one of the countries, they didn't think it was going to be the next country because um, Senator Inhofe, one of Trump's biggest loyalists and supporters, he was against the uh, Declaration of Sovereignty in West Sahara. Um, and he opposed that very much. And Trump didn't want to go against him. But a couple of days before, he supported a law that Trump did not want to pass. And, you know, because of, you know, inter-American things, and they, and because Trump was no longer committed to him, Israel realized there's this path here and we can do that. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's like, it's the, the last, last, last agreement that we can do before there's a new administration. Um, and so they did it. Um, and that's just, just one example of, of how things are done. Of course, he was very upset enough about the thing, but you see how there's this interest that, I mean, People are not sitting in the room saying what would be better for the region. I might be a little bit cynical. I mean, of course, it starts with that. But in the end, Israel is just Israel. We think that we are the greatest, biggest, most powerful country in the world. But we're not. We're a small country in the Middle East. And our interest happens to be very similar with other countries, with other big powers like the U.S., 
and we're very, very good, and we've learned that for over 70 years, um, how to take advantage of those interests, how to be quick and smart and act quick um, to have things that would be better for as well. Thank you so much, Yuna. And um, it takes us kind of to the next stage of, so kind of a surprise. There was all kind of behind the scenes and it seems like every country that joined, it was kind of a surprise. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the reactions and the implication of those agreements. Um, I don't know if we could talk about all six of them, but uh, Karen, if you could start us with the nuance, you, st you started by saying that uh, there isn't really such a thing as the Ab Arab world, but I want to ask you, what does the Arab world, or if you want to take it apart and kind of tell us what different uh, Arab countries reaction was to this. Um, I would also, if you can already uh, talk a little bit about Israel and the Palestinians as well, and obviously, uh, obviously we would love to go back after to Yuna to hear a little bit from the field. Terrific. Thank you. Um, you know, I think that the, the Palestinian issue actually catalyzes and in some ways like reveals the beginning of the fracture of the Arab world, at least the way that we often perceive it in terms of Israel against the Arab world. Um, I think that those notions, you know, had already begun to, to show some fault lines already far before this, um, where you know, it's clear that there's a regional dynamic that's really separate from Israel, right? The largest wars that have occurred in the last 20, even 30 years have actually not been along Israel's border, but most notably in Iraq, right? Um, and for those that consider Afghanistan to be part of the Middle East, it would be really, so it's, it's really moving a bit away from Israel as the center of, of, of sort of interstate conflict. And as such, what we find is that the regional dynamics of the region started to sh take shape in different ways. And especially with the dissolution of Iraq, we find that there was a very significant balancing act between Iran on the one side, who was trying to gain hegemonic power and sort of focused less towards Asia and a little bit more towards the Middle East, right? Even though they were outsiders in some ways and Saudi Arabia on the other hand, balancing against those interests. And so as we started to see those states aligned along those two axes, and I don't think that that was new. But where I think the notion of the Arab world and what, what that sort of moniker helps us understand or doesn't, is that I think there was a sense for a long time, and maybe it was most crystallized by the Saudi peace initiative that had been uh, put forward, was that the Palestinian issue was an issue that united the Arab world, right? And that it was gonna be very difficult for any Arab state to move away from this sort of joint action. And what the Saudi peace initiative promoted was the notion that, that Israel in exchange for resolving the Palestinian conflict, and there's a lot, it's, it, there's a lot of detail not worth entering into, but the notion that what Saudi Arabia was leveraging was the unity of the Arab world in theory, and that what they were trading for Israelis making, uh, settling the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was normalization with essentially the entire Arab world, right? And what these agreements did was it started to dissolve that, which is it started to raise the questions of, can Israelis separate their view of the Arab world more broadly from their view of Palestinians? And I think that's an interesting sort of domestic question. But more importantly on the Arab state side is, can Arab states be sufficiently bold to depart from Saudi Arabia, begin to pursue their own interests first, ahead of sort of the interests of the Palestinians, right? And in normal international relations, states look out for themselves, right? And so this notion that the UAE and Bahrain said, we still, in a way have this annexation thing that we're going to take off the table to sort of placate maybe to some extent what the what the Palestinians are about to feel which is betrayal right because we're going to normalize relations because it's in our interests and yeah we understand that there's still like significant issues with the, with resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict but not ahead of our own domestic and international interests and when when each of these states start to pursue their own interests you start to see that they're not united on the issue of the Palestinians and you see this both at the sort of government level, but you also see it in terms of the, the protests on the street. One might have expected, for example, that while the ruling class could make, can take these risks, the people would revolt, right? This was gonna be unacceptable. And in fact, what we find is that there are some protests in certain places, for example, in Morocco, there were significant protests, but this wasn't uniform, right? And even in those places, in those states where you would have thought that the Palestinian issue would have led to demonstrations on the street, we don't see uniform reaction. And so I think that this is a real change in the way that Israel has now an opportunity to pursue bilateral relations with different states, not with Saudi Arabia in a way losing some of its leverage or some of its grip on what, what it is to offer. Now, it's been a long time, right? Which is to say, even since the Saudi peace initiative, it's been a long time. And so I think the states themselves, so how, how much longer? 
right? And we find, now, by the way, this isn't new. So we can go back all the way to 1968 and start to see that some of the states had started to say like, well, the Palestinians need to figure out their situation. And in a way, by elevating the Palestinian leadership, they also said, well, it's no longer our problem. We no longer fight interstate wars on behalf of the Palestinians. And that's in some ways why the Yom Kippur War looked a little bit different than even the 1967 war. So I don't think any of this was new, but now it's public and it's formalized. And I think that does sort of shift the way that we think about the Palestinian issue as catalyzing the Arab world in a very uniform or systematic way, or even in a very spicy way, right? I don't think we see the, the sort of uh, reticence of these regimes to enter into these agreements um, in, in a public way. And, and then the flip side is, so how does the Palestinians feel? Right? And the Palestinian leadership, because of this, felt betrayed. Right? In a way, they had, I think, hoped right, that something like the Saudi Peace Initiative and the unity of the Arab world around the issue of the Palestinians would, would, would give a cost. Right? It, would, it, would, it would force the Israelis, for their own interests, right? for the interests of normalization and greater economic relations, to make good on or to try to move forward the Palestinian issue. But now it seems like the Israelis don't have to do that. Right, which is to say they can pursue their own economic and security interests and, and they can keep the status quo with the Palestinians. And it doesn't seem to be, there's not even like a hook, right? Like the annexation hook is, is like they, rever they reverse the policy that probably wasn't gonna happen, right? And so there aren't a lot of hooks and there aren't a lot of teeth that were built in, not even symbolically, right? So these agreements don't say anywhere that this is contingent on, for example, a, a, uh, resuming talks, right? Like which, which has happened in the past and often like nothing happens, but at least there's the sense like tipping the hat towards the idea that this is gonna advance things. And so I think that this signals that the Palestinians can no longer assume that the world's gonna wait for them, right? The Arab world's done waiting. Um, and I think that there's no expectation anymore that a change in the status quo is a prerequisite for any kind of normalization. Um, and this is, really an important change um, for them. And I think that it's highlighted that now many Arab states are more concerned, right? Especially since the dissolution of the Cold War, they're much more interested in regional stability. They're much more concerned about Iran. They're much more concerned about their own internal domestic challenges and the Palestinians, but it's farther down the list, right? And they're, they're a backseat to their own fractured internal politics and not in, they're not gonna sort of pay a big political capital price for the Palestinian cause, right? And I think that this was, this was a big change. Now, again, we're in 2021, the Saudi Peace Initiative was advanced in 2002, right? So it's been a long time where there's been a sort of a, we've been stuck, right? There's not been a lot of movement. And so the region's moving on. And I think that that was a bit of a wake up call um, to the Palestinians. Um, I think that was maybe the biggest surprise for them. Thank you, Karen. Yuna, can you tell us more a little bit of yes. the reaction uh, and, and implication in this, that we're seeing in the streets? Yeah, so I, I do want to add to what Karen said about Palestinians is that after the hard years that they had during Trump administration of moving the American embassy to Jerusalem, closing the, a, closing, um, the consulate, uh, stopping all the money and the aid, it was really tough years. And they were like thinking, okay, um, it, it's, you know, it's just like, it's, it's, it's just these four years, um, we're gonna get past that. And then suddenly they started to realize it's not just them, something is changing in the world. And the fact that the countries all of them said during, like Karen mentioned, um, we do think there should be a peace agreement between Israelis and Palestinians. We believe in the two state solution that even does, um, it, it is mentioned within the agreements, within the accords of the two state solution. We, we think this should be the answer, but it's not something that Israel said, okay, we're going to do tomorrow, not even to talk with the Palestinians. And, and so they are in this new situation with, I don't think they thought about that. Not, not, I mean, they had no expectations from Trump, but from the other um, Arab countries. And I think that when we'll get to what Israelis are thinking about it, but even look at, at the response around the world. And, and there was just one thing during the election uh, here in the US, just one thing the Biden campaign had to, you know, get a, a statement out 
that was for something that Trump did. And these were the Abraham Accords. And I, I mean, you know, I, I read it. And I know how hard it is during a political campaign that you have to agree with something that your biggest opponent is doing. It, it didn't happen around anything, not COVID, not anything, anything, anything. And this is said, this is a, a great step. It's an important step towards peace. They are saying right now, it's not a substitute to peace with Palestinians. It's not instead, we think that Israel should pursue peace with Palestinians. But it's an important thing, and we are looking forward to other countries having normalization with Israel, and they are going to continue something that Trump has started. I mean, this is a major issue. I don't think there was ever such a big consensus around something. But you do hear also in Israel people that are saying, they're not saying the normalization itself is bad, but that it takes the focus from the most important thing, which is our relationship and our conflict with the Palestinians, something that we need to solve and resolve. And the fact that, like Karen mentioned, you don't have that leverage anymore of other Arab countries, that is something that can hurt the peace process and, 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 you know, and, and have that dream or, or the two-state solution go even further away from um, our reality, but I do think there was a consensus. I do think that it changed something in the way that Israelis look at Arabs in general on the Arab world. A year ago, I'm talking a year ago, even though the um, flights, for example, from Israel to Dubai and Abu Dhabi, it's something uh, relatively new because of COVID. But for example, if you hear about someone who's traveling for business or whatever to Dubai with a foreign passport he would tell you how he's doing that almost like he's a top secret you know agent um like a like i'm sad wannabe and he has to have a foreign passport and he doesn't talk hebrew nowhere and you know he doesn't wear anything that has hebrew on it and no one should know he's israeli and then poof like six months later you see tens of thousands of israelis going to dubai posting all over it's like this suddenly like this it's a normalization, right? But it's like this warm peace where everybody is, is hugging our new friends from, uh, from the Gulf region. People that in Israel, people thought about them. We have to realize that as enemies. And this is something, first of all, it shows you how quickly you can change the way that people think. When you see two leaders calling each other now friends, not talking like enemies, but talking like friends and we have our mutual interests and this is really big people who really were fr afraid before you know it, it's like it's it's like that and it, it gives you a little bit of hope of of how power leaders have well they do they do and people follow that and it was really amazing to see and i also think it had an inner effect in israel because you know the Arab language, for example, was something that had a connotation sometimes with like security and, 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 and Israelis were a little bit afraid because of the history and because of terror attacks and because the, you know, long year conflict that, that we had and, 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 some, and, you know, and suddenly people want to learn Arabic. They wanna, they wanna go to the countries, not just in terms of tourism, they wanna learn, they wanna learn about the culture they're not embarrassed of them talking Arabic or, or different dialects of Arabic uh, also in Morocco and their families coming from Arab speaking countries. And they know that and they're proud of their legacy. I mean, it, it, it's just a few months, but it kind of changed the way. And also it showed sometimes a little bit the hypocrisy of inner Israeli politics and how people treat Arabs and Palestinians living inside Israel and how they treat those in the Gulf region, like, you know, the more exotic, that's what I'm saying, because it, it shows a little bit the hypocrisy of, of the Israelis. And I, I think that it's, well, we, hear, we see now a big campaign for Netanyahu calling for um, Arab supporters, Arab voters. This is something that we never saw before. We know Netanyahu even talked against Arabs and said, you need to vote for me because Arabs are going to have a lot of power in the Knesset, in our parliament. So this is like a really, really, and I'm not, I'm talking like 2015, not, you know, decades ago. So we do see a shift. I think it's something that has to do with that. There's this normalization, not just with Arab countries, but within the Israeli society 
towards the language, towards Arabs. And you see Netanyahu going to um, Arab cities and, 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 you know, seeing and calling people, come get vaccinated and doing his campaign and traveling. And, and I mean, you see the shift and I want to show you something that I think, I mean, it, it, it's kind of funny, but I'll show you the picture um, be, be, because it, it really shows like the, um, like the, uh, the thing. So these uh, two guys here, um, they're actually two um, yeah, Israelis from uh, Kfar Qasim. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's an Arab village. I mean, right like half an hour from Tel Aviv. I grew like really like across from them. I know it very well. And they put on the, you know, like the traditional golf kind of um uh where and and they were going around in, in in tel aviv and making a video and showing how everybody's coming to take pictures with them and everybody you know wants to and they were telling them oh at the end you know we're here we're from for casa we always been here you could have you know like to take pictures with us and love us and, and one just like to get to know us like you know for for the past 70 years even though we don't dress these usually and you know we're like the different kind of Arabs. So it shows you kind of, I think like a little bit of, of the hypocrisy, but they made it like as a joke and it was funny and they were interviewed everywhere. Um, but I do think that there's an impact that would have uh, some sort of a new normalization and, and maybe there would be studies about it, about the impact years to come uh, because you do hear the difference and again if you ask the Israeli you know the average Israeli it, is it normalization is it peace um, they say we never fought with them what does it change you know within my life but again you we have this real peace agreement with Jordan how many people have visited Jordan how it changed the lives of the average Israeli not so much for the past couple of months more than 50,000 Israelis um, visited Dubai, the UAE. Okay. So, so a lot can say, well, it really changed my life because I did business now then, and I went to travel and it's amazing. And, you know, I've been to this place where, where I can never be. So kind of puts you, you know, like not the diplomatic or the regional or the strategic one, but just like street level impact yes. on the average Israeli. Definitely. Thank you so much. And I definitely relate. First of all, my Facebook is just full with pictures of friends and colleagues <laughs> and people from the past just uh, taking picture in Dubai. And the, the second part of just identity as a Libyan Arab Jew, I, I really relate to just uh, how we look at the Arab world and uh, maybe even the expectation of having more peace processes and more agreements with more countries and the ability to maybe one day return to where mm -hmm. Uh, our grandparents uh, have, have came from. Um, we don't have a lot more time, but I kind of want to go through the questions that are coming and the interests that are coming from our audience. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to uh, you know, ask you a couple questions that I think uh, could be addressed maybe together. So first of all, uh, regarding the parties in Israel, uh, if uh, they're all kind of in agreement uh, about this process, um, if there's any uh, resistance. And the second is, how is the relationship uh, with Biden and Netanyahu will affect the future of, this, uh, of the Accords? Uh, so I would say shortly that I think um, that the future of the Accords would be, I mean, I don't think that it's in the first interest of this administration as it was in Trump, because they do put uh, COVID and the new relief and, and you know all the crises that they have to handle before foreign policy, but they have said publicly that they are gonna support, they are gonna encourage other countries to normalize relations with Israel. I don't know if it's gonna be like their thing because we have Iran other things, but definitely they support it. And I also think that you won't hear, I mean, again, as it was a consensus here, it was a consensus also in Israel, you, you do hear voices against it, but in, in, you know, in the common field, you won't hear anyone talking against it. And like Karen said, there was a dispute about the sale of the F-35 from the US to the UAE. Was this the real reason? Did Netanyahu agree to have other countries with this uh, power power in, in the region just for him to have during, you know, a, in a, a year that an election that are not ending, um, uh, this thing that he can show to the world. Uh, so it was in that, I mean, it, it's, it's Israelis, you know, we're, we're always going to have something to say against and we're always going to have criticism and we always are going to be very, very cynical. But again, 
you would not find it. And, 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 and I also will tell you, it's not something that people talk about every day. When people talk about Dubai, they're talking about how many people came into Israel with the British variant. Um, that's what they're talking about. No one is like talking about, oh, there's peace. It's amazing. They're talking in like the economic way, the tourism way, COVID way. Um, so I even think in terms of the elections and how many, you know, like mandates more is it going to bring to Netanyahu because he did during this year, this piece, I think it's already like within, you know, those who admire him, those who are going to support him are definitely going to say, look, he even is making peace, you know, it's, it's just like leaders from the right that are making peace in Israel. That's our history. And people that are against him are going to say, well, it doesn't have to do with him. It would have happened anyway. I mean, they're not saying it's bad, but they won't give uh, for him, for example, the credit uh, for it. So it's, it's not a major thing now during the election. Thank you. I'm not sure that it answered uh, also Dean's question. So Karen, I want to ask you, uh, is there some anything uh, potentially negative about the agreements on the political side? And is there any chance that the, for many other reason that uh, maybe not necessarily because of the connection between Biden and Netanyahu that the agreements could be uh, walked back? So I think that um, I'll start with the walked back, which is uh, agreements have been walked back and right and we can see that Morocco in 1994 established relations and then walked it back and, you know, as, as a result of the, the violence on the second intifada and now they're back. So I think, uh, I guess, never say never. Right. On the other hand, we see that other peace deals, which we have thought what might have been unstable, remained remarkably stable. So I think when CC came to power in Egypt, there was a big question around whether the Egyptian peace treaty would remain uh, a treaty and whether it would be violated or walked back. And in fact, it's, it, has, it has stayed not only a quiet border, but by and large, it's been it's been upheld in the same way that we that it's been upheld in years past. It's just as cold as it's ever been. Um, and I think to Yuna's point, not not very, lots of Israelis go into the Sinai Peninsula, though I think less than before, but very few go to Cairo and that those are not um, sort of, and it's a real shame because having spent some time in Amman, Jordan, I can say that it's quite lovely and, and it's a shame that there aren't the same types of, of warm relations. In fact, Amman in some ways is very reminiscent of Tel Aviv. Um, and so I think it, it is sort of interesting to think about you know, is this driven by the exotic nature? Is it the sort of the, the Dubai feels just a little bit different um, than the next door neighbor? Or is it a, a, a product of the long standing relations that were really troubled for many, many years, right? Inclu you know, both around issues of the Palestinians, but also more broadly. Um, are there negative effects? I mean, I think it depends on where you sit is where you stand, right? And I think that, I think the more that there are normalized relations in any region, the better. Right, the more that there are agreements of peace and quiet, I think that those are, and the more that Israel is integrated into the region economically and from a security perspective, I think it, it's a net positive, and I think it's a net positive more broadly. Um, I think the Israel is sort of picking a side in a way, but I think it's the natural side that it would pick, which is to balance against Iran. And in some ways, there was just recently an article about whether there was a secret meeting with Netanyahu. Yuna probably knows more about this than I do between Netanyahu and the Saudi regime and whether they're next or what's happening. And so I think we'll see. They did not right? deny it. I just want to say for the record, there wasn't a denial that there was a meeting uh, from the Israeli side. Anyway. Which is a really big deal, right? Yeah. Um, and and so I think that we're, we're seeing that... Um, whether the Saudi regime can take the step of normalization, it certainly seems to be cementing a Gulf-Israeli alliance of sorts. And the question of the Levant, I think, uh, is really unstable, right? I think that they're, they're not really active players. Jordan is not a particularly powerful country in the region. Syria is uh, enmeshed in its own civil war. Egypt is still in its sort of process of maybe democratization, but we're not sure. And so the, the, the centers of influence in the region are, are, are moving away from the Levant with the exception of Israel, which is now sort of an island in terms of power in that area. And so it is interesting to see how the balance of power is shifting in the region and how alliances are being formalized. So I, I don't think that there's negative um, on the international relations side of things, especially from the perspective of, of Israel or the Gulf states. Not sure it's so positive for Iran, Right. Um, I think that these kind of alliances may not be. And I, and I don't think it's very positive for the Palestinians. Um, and to the extent that, uh, that resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict would be a net positive for the region, I do think that these 
bilateral agreements and actually um, in a way divorcing or decoupling you know, normalization with the Arab world from the Palestinian issue does, and it is a real lever that's been lost. Um, and it's a lever that's been lost both by those that try to mediate the peace. So whether that's the United States or Saudi Arabia. Um, and I think, but in some ways it does lower the temperature. And so I think the Palestinians are not overreacting, right? I think that is, they are sidelined in many ways. And I think the cost of the status quo of maintaining uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict where it is, is incredibly costly. It's just sort of an invisible cost. And so I think the, the more that Israel faces the region sort of separate from its thinking on the Palestinian issue, I think that's not a net positive. But again, it's sort of a secondary effect of increasing normalization. And on balance, I think that it's a net positive. Thank you. So we only have a few more minutes left. Um, so first of all, uh, already at this point, I want to thank you both. I think we couldn't have hoped for any better combination of kind of like understanding uh, uh, everything about the accords and kind of like the basics and understanding the region and kind of getting into the, the field itself and kind of like hearing the story behind the scenes. So uh, wonderful and thank you so much for doing this um and we do have a couple more minutes so i want to ask if you have anything else that you want to kind of uh, leave our viewers and, and our community with today before we end so i would like uh, maybe to share um the short video because i do think that um we're entering a new age where we don't know how is it going to look the Bayat Netanyahu relationship and these two countries and the administration. We're going to see what the um, coming elections in Israel would also say. But again, we know how it was from Obama administration and Israel. It's different now. Um, Biden was uh, vice president. They do have an history, but it's, it's going to be different. It's going to be different because of Iran. It's going to be different because we hear the Israeli government and the American government, the administrations are talking very warmly about each other. I think they're looking for kind of a way not to start, you know, with this like big fight um, that, that people remember from before. And I also think that Netanyahu knows that after Trump administration, he does need now this administration and he needs to kind of started very nicely and I, and I want to share a video of a couple of clips of like it's it's just a little over a minute, a minute and a half and it shows you the long relationship of Biden with Israel the things that he said before um the things you know the good times also the bad times uh, there's this one time and you'll see that when Biden came to Israel and while he was visiting the approved 1600 units um uh, to build uh, in the West Bank. Um, and it, he got really insulted by it. It was really like disrespect while he was visiting uh, Israel. And also, of course, Netanyahu's speech um, in Congress against the GCPOA, the Iran deal. Um, so I, I just leave you with that because I do think that that is something um, it says a lot about their... Uh, wait, you know, I would like to uh, just wait for a second. We'll end with the video. And I want to ask if Karen has any kind of final words before we go into the video and we'll conclude there. Sure. Um, you know, I think I'll, I'll go back to where I started, which is I think that the Abraham Accords, in a way, both brought to the surface um, underlying dynamics that existed in the region. And that some of our assumptions sometimes that we walk into understanding the Middle East have to do with calling things the Arab world or the Arab street. And I think these accords have highlighted once again, the diversity of state interests, of the differences in, the, in, in how domestic populations and different people's relationship to Israel, curiosity about Israel, cur you know, relationship to the Palestinians. And so, you know, it's sort of an invitation to always dig behind the headlines, to dig a little deeper, because I think all of our generalizations have been questioned, um, not just by these accords, but also by these accords. And so I think as we try to understand the region, which is ever changing, it's um, it's a healthy reminder, you know, that these states are not one big state. They are actually states with diverse interests and diverse culture and 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 a real rich diversity that has uh, opened the door for these new a new day. I think in the Middle East in many ways. So Daraba and Yona, let's uh, go to the video. Uh, thank you. Age thirty, barely thirty sworn in as a new senator, I went to Israel. I got to meet 
Golda Meir. I met with every prime minister since then. It was after the Six Day War. She said to me, standing to her right, don't look so sad, Senator. We have a secret weapon in our battle against the Arabs. And I thought she's about to tell me something that was classified. I swear to God, she said, Senator, we have no place else to go. I am a scientist. You don't have to be a Jew to be a scientist. Vice President, do you remember the time that we were the new kids in town? <laughs> Maybe a friend of mine for the last 40 years. I have a picture I signed for Bibi years ago when I was a senator. I said, Bibi, I don't agree with the damn thing you say, but I love you. <laughs> the decision by the Israeli government undermines the trust that we need right now in order to begin as well as produce a profitable negotiation. That deal will not prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons. It would all but guarantee that Iran gets those weapons. Lots of them. There should be no tolerance for any member or employee of an Israeli administration referring to the president of the United States in derogatory terms. Period. 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 Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. There is a relationship with Joe Biden for close to 40 years. I know him as a great leader of the United States. I'm sure that we will continue to work with both of them to continue to strengthen the special relationship between Israel and the United States. So, as you see, um, she has been a love-hate relationship. So... We'll see where it goes from here. It depends a lot from, on, on both sides. So it, it definitely is going to be a very interesting period with um, Israeli-US relationship. Yes. Thank you both so much. Thank you, Sarah, for opening our program and Central Synagogue community for having us all tonight. And may we all have an Erev Tov. And uh, I hope uh, we'll see each other soon again. Toda Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.